Hello, you're listening to Don't Listen to This, a podcast all about the thousand one albums you should listen to before you die, or allegedly should. I'm your host, Ewan Gledo. Remember to introduce myself. Fantastic. Um, I'm operating with one ear at the moment, so it's it's just a bit of a messy one for me. Um, but as ever, I've got reinforcements. I've got a guest. Very, very great to have Luke Robson with me. Welcome to the show. The show. I'm, hey. <laughs> make it sound like I'm, I'm a 90s sitcom host. Like, oh, welcome to the show. Um... Thank you very much for joining me. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. What What have you been listening to recently? What, what's, what's been on the agenda? Oh, I'm trying to actually think. Um, I've been going. I've kind of like on repeat. I've got like a Wet Legs sort of debut album. Yes. Um, to be honest, I've been going into like a lot of like shoegaze kind of stuff, mm. um, which is sort of like because I've been listening to that. It's ended up going back. I'm like a huge fan of. Sonic Youth, so oh, um, I've been ended up like because there's like a lot of kind of like arty punk sort of stuff. So I've been going back into that, and yeah, just um, just a lot of like weird sort of experimentally like uh, guitar effects heavy sort of music. Uh, weirdly enough, so yeah. yeah, brilliant. I mean, I'm I'm glad you brought up wet leg. I've been waiting for someone to bring that up because yeah. <laughs> wet leg is <laughs> phenomenal. Was that a truck oh, yeah. or a car? Uh, sorry, that was like the loudest motorbike going. I'm, I'm say, at... that, was, that was massive. That was brilliant. Yeah, I'm at I'm at uh, work at the moment. Um, oh right. Yeah, everyone's wandered off. So uh, yeah, I just Fantastic. figured I'd use their computers. So. Yeah, they do look quite snazzy. We've got like what you yeah, call yeah. I've got a mouse mat here. Mine isn't light up though. No, we've got a. Uh, I know. Actually, that looks terrible for that. It is lighting up, but <laughs> I was gonna say, I've, I've got this, yeah, yeah. but I thought it broke for about a day. I like to go and get another one. But, you know, speaking of broke, I've just backed out of the tab with all my notes on. So, love it. <laughs> in utero, Nirvana. Yes. I mean, a lot of talk about. Now, usually I read out an insert for the album that has been written in the Thousand One Albums book. And I think this is the first one where I've thought, really? Where it's kind of like, it was that an American idiot I've read and thought, well, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so I'll delight you with that because it's okay. it's quite a lot actually, surprisingly. Um well unsurprisingly. But to set the scene, in utero released nineteen ninety three, Kurt Cobain, Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic. I imagine I've absolutely butchered his name, but we'll, we'll it's close enough, yeah. It's close enough, it's <laughs> ideal, yeah. Uh, grunge, noise rock and post hardcore are the big three genres for this one. It's the third and final Nirvana album and it sold fifteen million copies. Just a, a little margin. It's, yeah, it's tiny. okay. It's all right. Five times platinum. That's wow. And I'm sure we'll talk about this in a moment. But Steve Albini produced it, yep. and obviously there was a bit of fallout regarding Heart Shaped Box and a couple of other tracks, which is briefly mentioned in this insert I'm about to read. So, rock history is littered with albums crushed by the weight of expectation. In Utero has remained steely rigid, still a presence today despite being the follow up to Nevermind, the grunge landmark of the 1990s. Kurt Cobain was a reactionary in the truest sense. Nirvana strove to pull away from the metal sound on debut Bleach with the polish of Nevermind. Within Utero, they brought in punk producer Steve Albini. But fans and critics need not have worried. If anything, Albini's early work with the Breeders and Pixies was much more chart-friendly than In Utero. It is not a punk album per se. The Beautiful Dumb is a case in point, with soft cello and an envious lyric, Kurt Pines for the Simple Life. Penny Royal T was similarly affecting and paced, but the band could also destroy a listener with brute force. Open a serve the servants sees Kurt forgiving his absent father atop a boisterous, off kilter rhythm, and the explosive Tourette's is as good an instruction as any for the hairs on the back of your neck to stand erect. Yet in utero was not free of troubles. Geffen sniffed at an early version, and REM producer Scott Litt was brought in to polish off some of the edges. By this point, and with Kurt's spiralling drug problem, fans begin to speculate that the singer was becoming angry, that his intentions might soon lie elsewhere. With increased press intrusion into his marriage to Courtney Love, the fear was that In Utero might never be released. Thankfully it was. The album remains Nirvana's most arresting, signposting at the melodic direction the band would hopefully have taken had Kurt Cobain lived. It's quite a quite an intro to In Utero. Uh, I think it yeah. sets the groundwork. Initial thoughts, though, really. In Utero, what? What are your memories with this album? Because you, you requested In Utero, which was yeah, remarkable. Yeah, you gave me the um, very, very easy challenge of uh, picking like out of some amazing... I think actually this this album, the dirty one from Sonic Youth, might have been on that list as well. Yeah. And 
yeah, I was uh, I was actually the the two that I was really split on uh, when I had to pick an album was the Pixies Do Little album, and yeah. yeah, I the thing was I'm like I'm not the most like you know musically um, trained person. Like I just kind of like I hit the drums <laughs> and then they make the sound. I'm like cool, like I'm I'm doing it. So I didn't know how, to what degree I'd be able to do <laughs> do that album justice because I know it's like brought up all the time but then um you know I was kind of thinking like what actually I just want to double check is my voice definitely coming through on the uh podcast re- recording it is yeah okay, I, that's, that's that well. I was a bit that's... concerned there yeah no um, no no, no. That's, I'll tell you what I'll sorry. pause and double check it was I was trying to decide between those two albums Pixies Doolittle and um In Utro and I was sort of like you know, I, I've got like, so I've got like a tattoo on my leg um, of like, I don't know if you can see it. It's a bunch oh, of like, um, like cassette tapes and stuff yeah, with yeah, like yeah. a bunch of bands when I was like a teenager that I was into. And you got like Sonic Youth, Pixies, Nirvana, Pearl Jam. Like it was basically just like the grunge sort of scene, yeah. right? Um, and so I was like, you know, I, I was thinking like, all right, I'll do one out of that. And I think for me, like the In Utero album sort of like encapsulated like everything I really, really like uh, about that kind of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, because originally, like, I wasn't really into music for like years and years until I sort of became like a teenager. And, um, you know, I, I'd already I'd always been like kind of playing instruments a little bit, but it was more out of like, oh, it's some sort of something that I have to to do you know just because that's what everyone else does but like the the music that i was sort of surrounded by like i'm from northumberland and you know i in sort of and in Morpeth, which is like you know pretty well off like middle class sort of town um and it was just like you know folk bands kaylee bands orchestra choirs it it was like you know either like religious or just like I don't know some like weird folky thing and I was just like man I hate all of this like music (laughs) isn't for me and that was just what I was surrounded by you know and um and then I was just like you know very like anxious kid and all that and I came across like um and I'd always known sort of like about like smells like teen spirit and stuff and I was just playing the drums and I was I was listening to like um you could get like drumless tracks on YouTube and I came across like oh yeah it smells like Teen Spirit let's play it and I was like oh that was really fun and then um I came across Lithium and I listened to it and I was like oh my god that's that's like amazing this this track and it was it seemed like the perfect song to me and I just like ends up listening to it again and again and again and I know I just got deeper into Nirvana which then branched me out into like you know all these other bands that were from the same scene and so I just ended up falling in love with that and I kind of like for me uh, Nirvana had this like and this was you know I was like full-on like 15 16 like super angsty teen so Nirvana was like, perfect you know and just just um you know in in utero had like this explosion of like you know all the guitar blemishes just like loud half the time it was like you know and nirvana had this sort of attitude this like punky attitude of like we don't care if our instruments are in tune and you know all the music stuff around me at the time was like you know very like oh let's be all technical and like very um how does this orchestral piece sound that sort of stuff that was like what i was surrounded by of in northumberland and it was like it was like almost the direct polar opposite of it it was like how how do i break this instrument as fast as possible rather than like you know sort of um so i, I don't know it just like massively jumped out to me and so when utro um was kind of encapsulated that like let's just get this absolutely fucked noise out there so yeah that's why i ended up picking uh in utro and I realize I just went on some like personal no, no, kind of perfect. rant that's, there. <laughs> is what I think if anything, that's... what I've learned is that me talking about music is terrible because I've I've looked back on some of the things I've written about music and thought, what the fuck was I thinking? It's, it's terrible. <laughs> so like within utero, I think um 
embarrassingly enough, the first time I listened to Nirvana properly, like an actual album, was last year. Um, I'd listen to Smell Like Teen Spirit because I think it's impossible to, to get away from that if you're going to yeah. go out on a night out in Sunderland. Um, that's always there. It's a constant. Um, but the first time I'd actually listened to it was never mind. I got it on vinyl. And the only reason I got it, I don't know why I'm yeah. pointing like behind me. I know it's there. I did you spot it before. It. <laughs> but when I do the edit for the video, nobody else can see it because it splits. Oh. It's there though. I promise it's there. And I got it for like a tenner on Amazon. I was like, right, okay, well now's now's the time to listen to it. I'll get it done. And I thought it was brilliant. I thought Nevermind is absolutely fantastic. I was like, brilliant, I'll give this more of a listen. And I got round it in utero the first time I listened to it, I thought, oh, fuck me, what's all this then? And I thought, yeah. this is terrible. And it, it wasn't the, the fact that the playing was terrible or anything. I just thought, no, that's not for me. And I couldn't yeah, justify yeah. why. And that's bugged me ever since. So it was nice to go back to it and think, well, what is it that I really don't like about this album? And it's nothing particular anything yeah. like that it's it's actually grown on me quite a lot and from hearing you say it like you said it's sort of nirvana is is uh, god forbid we go against that very tight schedule i sent you before we did but the legacy of nirvana is essentially like the opening for a lot of people it's it's the the gateway drug into some yeah. great great bands and it was for me in utero prompted me to go and find other bands in the same genre because i thought there must be something to this that i'm missing and there was as it turns out my eardrum i'm missing that and that really does make it difficult to listen to new music but as far as in utero goes there is a real cultural shift and you could feel that on Nevermind, you could feel it on bleach but you can yeah. feel it on in utero and it feels so different here than it does on Nevermind. and despite there only being what two years between the releases Something so like that, yeah. so different and i suppose a lot of that comes from the impact and like you've just spoken of there mm. the impact of in utero is massive it's huge, and obviously you're in a band, and I think this yeah. is the first time I've had a musician on where it's, you know, they they are nearby. I can actually go and see them live. So, it's, what what is it about in utero? Do you think that impacts you with your music? Yeah, um, I think just you know, I it it's weird. Like in in our band, each of us kind of has like our own different sort of kind of way about playing and like music that we're into weirdly enough it's kind of like it's all sort of coming together from like totally different angles like i'm i'm really into like the sort of like punkier stuff so yeah but you have things from like nirvana to like then you know more modern like idols and black midi and um you know i'm blanking on half of them but just, just if it's like like mets um are like this noise punk band from canada and who are like it's it's literally just like no melody, just like as loud and as screeching guitars as you can possibly like get them. And I was just quite quite like that. Um it's sort of like a weird like I don't know, like I was sort of like nihilism, but for music of like I wanna purposely like not play this correctly and it's all about like just the energy. And that's I don't know I just like always always like really got in got into that. But then our like guitarist I know he really likes um, John Mayer, <laughs> which is obviously like very beautiful <laughs> guitar playing. And then um, our like singers really into like U two and um, I guess like a lot of the sort of um, we, we actually both are quite into like some post punk stuff like Fontaine's DC and um, and then our bassist is probably like the most like musically proficient out of all of us like he um he listens to like mostly just like instrumental stuff i think he's into some like jazz as well but um yeah we kind of um we all sort of bring something like totally different to the band and um you know at, at the moment we're kind of like uh, i know a couple of us are sort of looking at like shoegazy kind of stuff because it sort of has like a mix of like it can be quite like beautiful and like soundscapey yeah. and experimental yeah. but then also like there's clear like kind of punk roots in it because it is just so like distorted guitars and all of that and um yeah i forgot what the original question was oh don't worry i also <laughs> forgot what the i think i just invented was. my own question and answered <laughs> it, it, no it's a good answer you brought up a lot there that kind of is replicated in nirvana's in utero essentially especially the um that kind of seeing what you can do with an instrument that isn't making cohesive sound, seeing mm. really just how far you can push an instrument. And I suppose, you know, it, 
it, it feels like the obvious question to ask because I think for a lot of people, Dave Grohl is probably one of the most known drummers, name wise, yeah. apart from the guy from Queen that I can't remember the name of, Roger Taylor. No, was it Roger Taylor? I am that fella hard from Queen. Blanking. Ugh, that guy and Chris France yeah, from Talking yeah. Heads, I guess. But is it is is it in utero specifically that impacted you and your style and your playing for the drums as well? I don't like almost certainly. Um... I'm, and I didn't actually realize I was, but I'm a very, very, I'm like a thumper drummer, like, which is actually very similar to Dave Grohl. Like, I just like smash the kit. Half the time, like, so um, this past weekend, we just played Little Buildings in Newcastle. And um, I was like, and I was like trying to like play a lot more subtler because I have uh, such a bad habit of like playing so fast and so hard that like, I get like tennis elbow, <laughs> oh basically mid gear. I'll be like three songs in, and like I have to like no longer do I hold. Uh, I got like a fork here. You know, you hold a drumstick like that, right? Where it's yeah. like quite loose in your hands, and you can be all subtle with it. I go like so hard on it that I end up like gripping it like this, like you would a bat, like you're gonna hit someone, just because my hand locks up oh from going God. so hard on it. So I'm like, I'm trying to <laughs> stop that to save myself, but it's it's because of like the adrenaline when I'm like live yeah. and uh, before I go on. So I think I kind of like from what I've sort of seen from um, Dave Grohl's drumming sort of relate to that. Cause he's, he's quite honest about like, you know, he's not a subtle drummer. Um, and like, he can't really do all the technical stuff. He's, he's just like, I go hard. I like have energy, but you know, I like a, a lot of his, his stuff is quite like inventive. And I think sort of the, the thing that I take from it is like a lot of punk drumming that you get is kind of like, I'm just going to go fast, like straight line. And it's very flat, right? You know, it's like, like, and then you've got like three chords and it's just super flat. What I find from like a lot of Nirvana kind of songs and, you know, a lot of more like modern punk is that they break up the sort of drum beat. So it, it, you know, it feels fresh and it feels like there's something going on so you take a song like heart shaped box and i don't know it's like the rhythm has so many things going on in it while keeping it simple you know um and yeah there's there's like lots of little things that i i notice myself that i do and i'll i'll hear like um some of the songs about like oh man i just straight (laughs) straight lifted that like the way that um i think dave Grohl like accents the guitar with like symbols and stuff. And I try to do that quite a lot as well. So, I mean, that kind of goes into heart shape box again, but I know he does it like in a few different spots and in like, um, songs for the deaf from Queens of the stone age, when he was drumming on that as well, like, uh, you know, he, he does that sort of thing as well, but I don't, I cut, so I kind of relate to him in that way, I guess. Like, um, I, it's weird though. Like I'm, I don't really consider myself like a super like musical person, person just because i yeah. think anytime i yeah I, i've been in bands like for ages and ages but i've always been like the person who's just like hey you need the drummer i got it <laughs> i'll figure it out and then everyone else has kind of been like oh what um you know key is this in or whatever and i'm just like who cares like let's let, let's smash up the drums and let's just go for it but uh yeah yeah that's so, the that's... thing I, I think there there is a lot of so i mean when, when that springs to mind, when you say sort of like that, that lack of cohesion, that sort of energy that you can get from not really caring about whether or not it's in tune, just as long as it sounds good. Yeah. I always think of like Joy Division or even yeah. like completely wildly Trout Mask Replica, which is like completely the other end of the spectrum of that. Where it's I don't think what, what was that band? Trout Mask Replica. Like um, yeah, I gotta get Spotify up so I can uh, <laughs> save right. like, that. <laughs> It, that that just that's a cacophony of noise, and I think the difference is Joy Division's fantastic at that. Trap Mask Replica, and I'm sure I'll be talking about this on a future episode with someone. Fucking dreadful, I yeah, yeah, I got it. It's <laughs> I, I, in my mind, all of it kind of blurs together. Obviously, with different genres and different sort of sound bites, essentially, the the real core of it is let's make something that sounds interesting, and it doesn't really matter. We'll figure the technical elements out later. If we need it to sound like this, we can just replicate that rather than write it down and say, well, it needs to sound like this and branch into that. Mm. And you do get that feeling on in utero. And there are some 
brilliant songs on here. There are absolutely still oh, ones yeah. that really just uh, are, are leagues above never mind. And I suppose the the often overlooked one is Bleach, which is more of a, a rock album than yeah. hardcore. Um, I haven't said that, though. I think I prefer Bleach. I don't know. But... Um, yeah, it's it's weird. Like, I find there's some on Bleach that I, you know, I, I really like. It, I don't know. Bleach is such, like, a weird album for me because it kind of feels like you have songs like Negative Creep, yeah. which are just, like, super, super heavy, uh, or, like, Floyd the Barber, which is, like, similar. But then it goes into, like, About a Girl, which is, like, feels like super... It almost feels like a Beatles kind of song. It's, like, super yeah. nice and, like, delicate and kind of, like, a beat a little bit and I don't know I but then I feel like I feel like Bleach is almost like potentially kind of like if you took some songs from Nevermind and then took some songs from like In Utero and then kind of awkwardly put them yeah. in an album together it's like it's somewhat similar to that I don't know it's I need to listen to Bleach a lot more because that's yeah. it's the one album of like the three Actually, I know there's like incest. The MTV one and then the after yeah, this, yeah, in yeah. 2004, um, yeah. They don't really count. One's a yeah. live album, one's like a extra bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, though. It's it, it's kind of unnerving in a way that Nirvana could make that sort of very melodic, very soulful mm. music almost, and they just thought, nah, not that. We don't want to do that. Yeah. And and the the wailed themselves into very heavy, very not thrash metal, but very thrashy playing. And essentially, spearheaded grunge, which is um, yeah, as as a genre itself, I kind of find it hard to place because I I was brought up on Britpop, and Britpop was responsible for making sure grunge didn't get over here. Yeah, so it, it feels like a battle of the territories with the US and the UK. Um, so I I was brought up essentially like, oh no, not grunge, you can't listen to that. It's like, right oh, no yeah, worries, yeah. back the pulp for me. But it's on in utero, I think. It, it, there is a solid consistency to it. I think there are a couple of bits that don't work for me, and I mm. think it's more because I'm not wholly convinced by Cobain's writing. I think right. there's parts that are a bit spotty. I think stuff like Heart Shaped Box is obviously, you know, if, if you say a bad word about Heart Shaped Box, you need to say, you know, that's just silly. Yeah. It, even the most adamant haters of grunge and noise rock are going to agree that Heart Shaped Box is at the very least a cracking song. Yeah, Stuff yeah. like Milk, it's great, but I've never been wholly convinced by something like Penny Royal Tea or Scentless mm. Apprentice, and I'm never never sure why, and it was... I think the the lyrical qualities of Kurt Cobain are really solid. I think what they achieve is a level of sophistication that isn't found on other noise rock records, but at the same time, there's a real simplicity to it that I don't dislike. I appreciate why he's doing it, but it just doesn't grind well with the that big soundscape cacophony, the big thrashing drums, the huge guitar work. Yeah. Cobain's voice is great for what it's setting out to do, but then you've got sort of the very easy detraction of, um, I think it's, I can't even remember which song it is, it might be Serve the Servants actually, where it's sort of father, dad, youth, elderly, and it's a real simple comparison and contrast. But for me, it's sort of, he's he's not experienced that yet, he's not actually delved into that just yeah. enough. And I suppose I mean, a modern example for me would be Sam Fender with sort of the reflective period. And I know when I was talking to my friends about it, a couple of them said, is he really at an age where he should be reflecting? Can he actually justify looking back on his childhood at such a young age? And it's yes, you can if you've experienced it. And I don't I don't know where Cobain's got the, the elderly stage from, because when he wrote this, he was about 25, and that makes me feel terrible. I'm 22, and that's middle age, you know. That's yeah, I, I mean, it's it's my understanding on that on that track at least, and like I am definitely somewhat talking at my ass here a little bit, but like that's what I do for a living. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, it's like yeah, it, it's my understanding that like uh, you know he didn't get on well with his dad and stuff, um, right? And actually, I remember because I I got when I was a teenager got like super super into Nirvana and kind of going back, like, I, I haven't listened to them for a while, because I, I literally just listened to them too much, that I, like, kind of burn oh, yeah. out, but, like, yeah. you know, going back recently um, for for doing this, I, like, you know, there's, like, things I'm remembering, and, you know, I remember listening to, like, um, audio records from him, where he used to, like, you know, 
he he felt like uh you know there was play some like trauma with his dad and stuff so i wonder if like him becoming a dad which would would have only just would happened have been around that like, time, yeah. yeah yeah i wonder if like that's kind of like there's something there where it's like he now sees himself in you know that kind of situation and he was trying something there no absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean it's, uh, it's... He... sorry go ahead no it's all right you can go ahead it's the other guest oh, i was just going to say like uh i think like the sort of main thing uh lyrically in this album is like less well for me at least like when it's kind of placed in like the history of what was going on for him there it's like it's more of like rather than a reflection a reaction see you dude sorry my, my uh <laughs> co-worker just left sorry. um it's more of like a reaction to what was going on rather than like you know sort of like self-reflection because um yes. you know yeah. if, you, if you just imagine like they've just blown up to like the biggest most famous band in the world yeah it, and and it's like well how are you going to follow that up and you know like uh, i mean like the first line in that uh opening track kind of like sets the tone of like you know um what this album's going to be like um i need to look it up but it, it's something like um you know teenage angst has paid off well now oh, i'm bored yes. and old yeah yeah, yeah. just because it's like you know I, at, at the time i think because they come from the underground scene i think they were looking at that and going like we're kind of seen as like almost like sellouts you know and the nevermind album didn't have a lot of this kind of like punky sort of like vibes to it which is what they loved um it was you know you know very like almost like poppy in <laughs> in some kinds not obviously not to like actual like commercial pop music but it was no. like you know it's like very you know it's like catchy like yeah you know, um, in sort of like a Beatles-esque, like Motley Crue kind of way. And like, um, I think they were like, we need to make a statement and like get away from that. So like opening that kind of like first track with like just huge distorted, you know, crunchy guitars with feedback all over the shop. And then that opening line is kind of like, you know, it's it, it's him being like self-aware of like, and also, like, you know, sarcastic about, like, oh, yeah, you know, like, teen je- teenage angst, it's, you know, paid us well, basically. But now I'm, like, bored of that. Web. You know, he's, like, kind of, like, trying to be self-aware and, like, joking of what he thinks people might have assumed about him or whatever, yeah. you know, that they's, they're just some sellouts. So it's, like, cool, own it and make a joke about it so then we can move on and actually do the, the proper album you know that's kind of going on so and that that, you know it kind of shows up like in other parts in the um in the track as well like radio friendly unit shifter of just like we're not gonna make a nevermind album anymore we're gonna make this like we're not the band that you think we are we are still this like punky underground seattle scene band you know um but yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, yeah. I, I agree with what you said where it's sort of, it's obviously, Nevermind was huge and I think it's it's impossible not to talk about Nevermind when you talk about In Utero, but at the same time, In Utero is so far removed from what the band were essentially known for at that point, that punk underground scene, mm. that really harsh teenage angst, which is still sticking around with, um, I, I can't believe I've forgotten the name of that song that I listen to every Friday. <laughs> smells like teen spirit how would i forget that yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway it, the, the the teenage angst of that song is still there and present but it's for the next generation the generation after yeah and it's amazing that it's got such a longevity essentially as well after they they didn't reject those songs they didn't say we're not playing that anymore but they wanted to make an active decision to move away from that and yeah. i suppose that that makes sense bringing steve albini in as producer who's mm. I, I'm interested to hear what you think of the mix of Heart Shape Box, actually, because I, I, I've heard there's a different version of Heart Shape Box about that Albini produced, and then off the back of that, people were not too pleased in the producing studio. The label essentially outright refused to release it and said, go back and do this again. Make it a bit lighter. And and to do yeah. that, actually, you bring in R.E.M.'s producer. 
<laughs> yeah, I was, I, I don't know to what degree it was like, and I mean, so I was kind of looking up this up myself because, um, you know, I, I'd known about like Steve Albini because of, um, mainly because of like Pixies and stuff. Like, yeah. um, I think it was like Surfer Rosa or something like that album. Um, like, I really loved it. Um, yes. Like, Bone Machine and all that. It's like, love those songs. And um, so, but I never really knew. So I knew that he was like a good producer, but I just never really knew like what his reputation was on the scene. And yeah, like uh, I was looking up, you know, he's this huge, like, you know, controversial, punky producer who's like kind of rejects um, commercialization of music a lot of the time. And I mean, I was I was looking the other week. Apparently he like... Um, you know, he doesn't accept royalties for music. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He he just takes like a flat fee for the recording, and and also he does. He says um, it says on like records that he works on. It doesn't say like produced by Steve Albini. It says recorded by, because I think he he's like it's to make some like statement of like you know I'm it's like the band's music and stuff. And like, I'm not here yeah. for commercial reasons. So I'll take the flat fee to pay for the recording, but then anything that gets made out of it, you know, if this makes zero money, well, that's fine. Cause I got my payment, but if it makes a ton of money, fine, but that's irrelevant to me. And you know, cause I'm not gaining anything like financially from it. Um, I don't know if that was the case for just like in utero, but like, that's my understanding for like all music. He, um, records and stuff yeah. he's he just takes the flat fee i i that might be like citation needed but that is the the story that <laughs> i've heard and um yeah i so i don't know i was looking i'm just gonna get it up because uh i think it might be on the dulux edition of in utro when i was going back that to was listen it, to it yeah it was the either the dulux edition of it's like a, a special recording that they released which was essentially albini's version of Harsh yeah Reports. And I never got around to listening to it because it was about that time my eardrum burst. Oh just, no! <laughs> I had to stop listening to things. I managed to struggle through a Chumba Wamba album today, which okay. is, really sets the scene for how debilitating this one of your problems. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's weird. Like, um, so I listened to Hot Shade Box, um, like both the original version, and his version, and it's yeah, it. It's very weird. I can totally see why the record, like the um, you know, uh, what they call the like record company, the record label, were, like, stuff. Yeah, record yeah, label. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, while well, they were like, yeah, go back, change. You know that this is not. You know this could be better. Um, because it's like it. It's weird. It's like the vocals for me. They kind of like the way they pan around like my headphones it seems to like constantly be moving and it's like it feels so separate to the instruments it's just like it's a bit like um there's a thing on youtube where it's like people will like it's really weird people will, like whisper into the microphone i've forgotten what it's called oh it's, ASMR. that's it yeah like yeah. It, it for me when i was listening to it, i was like oh this has like a weird asmr-y kind of like effect <laughs> where it kind of feels like where it's going around, yeah, I know yeah, exactly what yeah, you mean. Yeah. Where it's like, it it's, feels like it's behind, yeah, yeah. It, it was just there was just something about it that like kind of caught me like that. But I don't know. I would, I think, I don't really know which I prefer really because it was yeah. like I remember um, one one of the things like I I saw. I think um, who was who was the guy that produced? Never mind. It was Vic. But uh, he's probably on the spot there. I'll, I'll get it up. And uh, I think it's like look, Butch you know, or Vic or something like that. Yeah. It might be like Vic Butch. I'll either but, um... make us look a lot better in the editing. Oh, done, done. It's this, you know. It... Nova... Butch Vig. Butch Vig. Butch Vig. Okay. Oh, well, there we go. Um, but we knew that you... first time. I I remember um, seeing some interview that he was doing where like when he was when they were recording like Nevermind. Um, you know, they used to ask Kurt to like, oh, do you think you could just do another take of this? Because it doesn't sound, you know, like just so we could have a back or whatever. But what he was actually doing was like, um, was so he could like layer up the instruments and give like a fuller sound and stuff. But like what my understanding is like Kurt wanted was like this drier kind of like grittier, like, no, no, the music sounds how it sounds 
kind of approach. And, you know, but, you know, they didn't have the, like, money or, you know, clout to really, like, um, make these decisions on their own. So when they were, you know, all of a sudden the biggest band in the world and they can make all these creative decisions, I think, like, a person, I kind of feel like they should have just let, like, Steve Albini do whatever you want because he seemed to be on the sort of like the exact same page as Nirvana of like no we just want this really like raw and like dirty kind of sounding album which is like totally against commercialization you know all of that sort of thing or at least you know has like some stances against it um so I kind of feel like and you know the his his mixes do sound like a little like messier but in a way that kind of fits right so yeah it does yeah yeah so i almost feel like it might have you know almost in a way been better to like have them as no this is the way that we want you to hear this even if it turns like loads of people off the album you know it's it's weird i I really don't know like no uh, it's it's, i understand what you mean where it's sort of like regardless of the commercial impact it has. I mean, obviously, In Utero did quite well, but yeah. as, as far as commercial <laughs> impact goes for an album, it, it's, it's a risk that artists eventually take, is is the new sound that we want to process going to sell, essentially. We're seeing that kind yeah. of with, with Arctic Monkeys, for instance, now with that switch from Favourite Worst Nightmare and whatever people say, I'm, well, that's what I'm not, to Tranquility Base called Telecasino and The Car as well, which at the time of recording isn't out, but when this is out, that'll be out as well, which is right. very confusing, but it's ideal. But you can already see that sort of the over-reliance on the mm. string sections on Tranquility Bass. They're on that better be a mirror ball, they're on body paint, and it's starting to creep in, and you can hear it, and you can just tell what's going to happen. People are going to go, we don't like this, and it's still going to be one of their big hit selling albums. Yeah, yeah, certainly. With with Nirvana, though, it, it feels as though that the, the core effect, the, the effectiveness of their music isn't lost, and I think that's the key. Hmm. It's that despite it being a massive switch from essentially, I've already forgotten the guy's name. Hang on, it was um, Butch, <laughs> Butch Vick, Butch Vick, Butch Vick to Steve Vig. Albini, there we Butch go. Vick right. to Steve Albini. It's such a huge change, but the change isn't what Nirvana can provide as musicians and as artists. The the change is really how it sounds and how it feels. And I, I suppose that that it, it's an interesting point you brought up about Steve Albini saying he's a recorder or a producer, and it's. I don't know. I don't know what to to what extent does that do a disservice to producers who've salvaged bad albums. Essentially, I'm always thinking of Pulp's last album until Scott Walker stepped in. It was a bit of a mess, but at the same time, it, it does feel like a lot of producers want to leave their stamp on an album. And for Albini to essentially back away from that means In Utero is essentially what Nirvana were aiming for. That is what they wanted to do when they first started making music. That's essentially the sound Nirvana wanted audiences to hear and it's it's hard to knock that. It's hard to fight against an yeah. artist essentially saying, Oh, this is how we want it to sound because that is their vision, that's their quality. Whether yeah. or not it works is completely different. Um it does to a degree. Um I feel as though sort of the legacy of the album is tainted obviously by Nevermind, the release of that, the image that this it's synonymous with counterculture essentially the the baby in the swimming pool. It's yeah, everybody yeah. knows that cover. It's it's like it, it's probably one of the most popular album covers of all time. I don't want to make that claim without backing it up. I've just forgotten every other <laughs> album cover. Um, something like Oasis. What's the story? Morning Glory. When he's walking down the streets, you know, people have gone to go and replicate the the album cover. Yeah, it's huge. But I think there's a real quality difference in the sense of Nevermind is a, not more commercial, but more unsure of itself in the sense that it's not Nirvana holy. It, it's not yeah. exactly what they're wanting to do. In Utero is pretty much the closest they got to saying this is what we want to do, this is how we're going to do it, and this is it. Um, and, and there are some great tracks. I mean, for me, Francis Farmer will have a rev- revenge on Seattle's quality. <laughs> Radio oh, yeah. Friendly Unit Shift is brilliant. Milk it and very ape, but really solid. I've never been quite convinced by the singles that were with the album, though, stuff like Penny Royalty. And even after listening to the MTV record, I realised that it's more just a, a lyrical disregard for me. I'm not really caring for it, but it's nice to have it there. 
Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, it, it, Penny Roll Two for me were like, it was. I kind of felt like it. it, it it's weird because I know like loads of people absolutely love that song, but yeah. I just uh, I don't know. For me, it just didn't really jump out compared to the other ones because I felt like, you know, by this point I sort of um, they had other songs which I feel like did what it does. Yeah, better because yeah, yeah, yeah. it it just sort of it it felt like a Nirvana song, but yeah. I felt like there were other songs that kind of did went further, and it sort of plotted right, kind of roughly in as it right in essentially. Yeah, you, you are essentially getting into the third act by that point. It's it's very much yeah, good. and I, round out that second part at, just after Milk It, and it's going into radio friendly unit shifter and Tourette's at that point, and it's. You know, yeah, yeah, it it yeah. just um I I feel like that song could be on like never mind. Yeah. And it would fit really well there. Or like it could be in Bleach and it fit really well there. It was just like the most kind of like <clears throat> it's not generic, but it's just like the most kind of like hey, this is a good song, but yeah. what are you doing different with it? Like Milk It and stuff was like okay, we're gonna take like we're we're aware of like the Pixies formula of like you know, quiet, loud, quiet, that sort of thing. Like the con, but we're gonna like massively contrast it and like, you know, to the point where like the vocals almost sound like they're like, you know, barely like coming through and like, yeah. you know, um, and then we're just gonna like in the loud sections just like slam it out. So I just I felt like there were other songs that were just doing more or like trying to be more interesting, but that yeah, yeah. so. That was nice to have a break, though, where it's sort of true. Yes, you know, <laughs> not every song. I feel like you get that with dumb, though. You know what I mean? You do, like, you do. Dumb yeah. is a very not 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 to sound daft, but it is a bit of a dumb song. But it, it's a yeah. nice break after such a heavy opening. You know that that yeah. triple of serve the servant, sentless apprentice, hardship box. That's quite heavy going, and you do need a bit of a time to sort of step back a bit and just go yeah. right. Let's not calm it down or slow it down because I don't think Nirvana could ever do that. You could never ask Dave Grohl to drum quietly. But they they attempted. They try and at least say, right, yeah, okay, yeah. we've we've had our fun. Let's just slow it down a bit. Let's re regroup, and then they do milk it, and then Penny Royal Tina is kind of just a bit scar shot by the end. But the overall complexities of in utero are just so fascinating. And yeah, it's, it, it, I I do think it's an in, a kind of alienating album for me, where it's like, I I like I like it. I like in utero. I don't think I could ever listen to it again. And again and again and again, or it's yeah. it's such an antagonistic album, and it, it it knows exactly what it's doing at the right moments that it's it's hard to recommend it to someone. If you were to say to me, it's like, oh, would you mind listening to Nirvana? It's like, yeah, no problem. It's like, do you want to do a new It's like, no, 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 never mind. Yeah. Therefore, <laughs> you know, it's like, just do that one. But at the same time, I really appreciate artists that can do that. And I really like it when an artist can make something that sounds so good but sound so difficult to listen to and I, Nirvana's one of the very few people that can do that I always think of the Velvet Underground as well with White Light, White Heat it's kind yeah. of, it's, it's there stuff like The Fall as well where it's so frenetic and angry and a, a real soundscape that can't be repeated and because it can't mm-hmm. be repeated it can't be re-listened to and it's a whole can of worms Yeah, but I suppose the what, what's the best track? let's just get it out, what's the best track? Um, <sighs> You gotta pick God. one. I mean, there's only twelve to pick from. It's not that hard, hard a challenge. Yeah, I. <laughs> the thing is, it it changes from each one. Like, um, mm-hmm. I mean, all apologies is definitely. It just feels like such a generic answer, but it's like it's probably yeah. definitely. More, you're right, Dave. Sorry, one well, my um my coworkers just wandered in. Uh, but it's like it's you know it's one of the, it, you know it's such like an amazingly like kind of beautiful song and stuff like. That it has to be up there, but then you know, I really like. Um, I think it might be Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, uh, but there's like a live version of it, and I think, I think it, it might is, be. Yeah, yeah it, it's either the live and loud one or. Oh, in Seattle. Yeah, maybe yeah. It, it. There's one of them actually. Uh, tell you what, like, um, rate me, but like their live at the Paramount one, it has, oh. like, this amazing, like, guitar solo in it, which, um, it's, like, it's literally just, like, a, a few bars, but it's, like, and then it's, like, follows from, like, a drum, um, 
little drum fill but it's like it's exactly what that song needed like just yeah. just something else but um yeah i think i'm split between those two like either all apologies or radio friendly unit shifter yeah i was gonna say radio friendly unit shifter as well it's um i put in my notes it's a good bit of heavy fun yeah i don't know what that means but i suppose <laughs> it was correct um it's a I weird mean, song as well because like the the chorus doesn't show up until like well into the back end yeah. of the song <laughs> i mean it, it's, it's probably based off the title right where it's like yeah, yeah we're gonna make the like least radio friendly song that we can possibly yeah. make but quite a few yeah. of those on this album <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah it's um yeah i, I think i mentioned one a second ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um i do like that technical quality though i do like it when an artist will go this is one of our biggest singles you can't play it on the radio and it's yeah yeah it, it says a lot about where nirvana found themselves not not just technically with their music and the quality of it but also with with their attitude to to record sales to to really not needing promotion at that point because they were mega they were mega stars yeah, they were yeah. huge um i do like milk it as well i just think that's a very violent song oh, yeah. it's fascinating um it's got a very drifty bass line to it i just love it it's really nice it's very very sinister However, I have to stop using that yeah. word because I called the Miles Davis album Sinister a couple episodes the, ago. The guitars in it, like during the verses, they weirdly remind me of like, and I don't know if this can make any sense, but like the way a spider kind of crawls. Yeah, like, no, that, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just like... It's that pace of it, yeah. Yeah, it's just very yeah. odd and like, like if that guitar was just like in a horror film, just yeah. like, I, I wouldn't question it. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Speaking of question it though, I think I know the answer to this. But oh, yeah. is there a replacement album for this? If is there an album out there that's in the Ooh. same genre that you could knock in utero out the way and just say, right, this needs to be on the list instead? Man, that's it's difficult. I think because I mean, I I've got like personal kind of like connection to this album from like being a teenager and like discovering it that like. You know, I never could. Um, but I don't know. I feel like I mentioned them before, but like there's some some bands out there who, who are more modern now, like uh, Mets. Um, I mentioned are like these Canadian punk band and stuff. Yeah. They've got, um, oh, what is that? I know one song's called Wet Blanket in it. Uh, that rings a bell, that. Yeah. I think I'm yeah, oh, it's just that. their self titled. Um, yeah one but like you know something from them or like um you know ty siegel um he plays or like uh the ocs they they play with a lot of like um you know distorted guitars and stuff but so i don't know like potentially there's there's something there where they go like a bit heavier or like they're so clearly like influenced from this music and they've come from it right but like um I think in terms of like anxiety, <laughs> yeah. downer music. This is yeah. like I don't know. It's got to be up there. It's, I think it's, it's you know, on, yeah. it, it, there's like a whole other layer to it as well. Where like you know, because he died in the way that he did, yeah. it's like you, it's almost impossible to like listen to that album yeah. and not be a you know, not think of like well, you know, was like part of this almost like a suicide note in a way, you know, and That's like... The thing, it's, yeah, it's so, whatever whatever discourse there is about in utero and music circles, it's to some degree is always going to be based on speculation of, well, what would this have done for Nirvana's next album? Or what would this have done for Kurt Cobain's solo career? Stuff like that. Yeah. It's all speculative. And, and regardless of the speculation, it's a very important album. From my perspective, though, it's three out of four Nirvana albums are on the list. You don't need three out of four. There's people there on there with more albums but less entries. Yeah. So I think out the out the three that are on there, I'd either bump this one or the MTV Unplugged set. But considering how much that did for MTV, it's kind of hard to get rid of it. So I think yeah. In Utero draws the short straw for me, unfortunately. I'd, I'd knock it off and replace it with New Plastic Ideas by Unwound, which is okay. I need incredible. To it's fairly primitive post hardcore noise rock, but there are some really brief elements in there that have the same quality 
of Albini's layering style, the soundscape audio appeal. There's a little right. bit of LCD sound. Did, did uh, Steve Albini do this one? I don't think he did. Um, he might have done because I didn't make that many notes on it. But we could have <laughs> we, we found another Albini classic, but it's it's got real like LCD sound system qualities of like oh, really? James Murphy vocals, mm. despite coming out a decade before LCD sound system ever released. Yeah, anything, yeah, which is delightful. Justin Trosper shouting away a decade before James Murphy ever did anything. Um, however, Murphy may have done it a bit better. <laughs> um, so if if there was a replacement, if I could contact Robert DeMarie who wrote Thousand One Albums, which I don't think he'll want to, he'll probably send me a cease and desist after he hears this episode. <laughs> I'd, I'd ask him why not uh, yeah. new plastic ideas. But at least now we can we can do the best part of any podcast really is plug away our socials, get all the the adverts out there. Um, of course, you can go first. You know, guess um... first. Yeah, um, I'm Luke. <laughs> I, I'm in a band. Um, we're called, well, we're currently called Finite Elements. Um, it's, it's We're in the northeast uh, of the UK, mainly based around like Newcastle, Sunderland sort of area. Um, we've got a gig coming up at Independent in Sunderland. Um, 10th of December, I believe. I might have totally got that wrong, but hey-ho. Uh, yeah, we're, we're on Spotify uh instagram everywhere all that sort of stuff um yeah i'm also i work as an animator so if you ever need any animations give me a shout <laughs> there'll be a rolling little thing that shows there we you go <laughs> and stuff. Don't worry about it. i was gonna say i mean we managed to get through the whole episode without actually mentioning finite elements uh somebody yeah. who was out on 14th of october it's oh fantastic. yeah yeah that the new well. single and stuff yeah. new yes 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 I, yeah. I didn't know about the indie gig though um last time yeah. i was in indie was for work to sort waves last year and the time before that was when I had mumps and I was really ill but I thought I need to go to Indy and then it was lockdown the week after oh wonderful oh I haven't been in a while but yeah um, was that um did you say waves as in the one with the double v I think so yeah it's it's just got a double v now yeah Yeah. they're like a California like surf rock kind of band right oh I was on about the um the festival thing in Sunderland Oh, I'm waves, totally though. not familiar with that. Oh, it's um, I don't want to plug even more, but I may as well. It was Let's um, go for it. <laughs> five or six different. Well, last year when it happened, it was like five or diff- five different venues, um, essentially mm. music all day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, really fun. Um, cool. From, nice. From what I can remember of it, because I was yeah. Quite but oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, five night. Fine night elements. Five night. Five night. Fi- fucking hell. Fine, fine night, night elements. elements. There we go. Somebody yeah, who's yeah. out on 14th of October. It is bloody good. So I oh, thank strongly you. recommend it. It's better than in utero. So get it listened to. There we go. I suppose yeah. we that. We've, we've get managed dunked to, on. Uh, get, uh, yeah. Kurt Cobain. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see you release another album now, Kurt. <laughs>